Hello and welcome back to Tea and Crones. I am the voice of the people, Dahlia Rose. I am a holistic healer, energy worker, and um, I'm here to be the bridge between you and these lovely ladies. Let's lead into who these crones are. Katrina, why don't you start us off? I'm Katrina Raspold. I've been uh, working in the magical arts for around, oh, I don't know if I can do that much math. Um, a lot of years, uh, around four decades. And um, I am a co-owner of Crossroads Metaphysical Store. I'm a professional witch author of around 38 books and tarot reader, uh, do spell work for people, do spiritual cleansings and healings and things like that. And uh, mom of six amazing grown-up kids. Wonderful. Corby, shout us out. Uh, 30 second elevator speech. Hi, I'm Corby Midline. I'm from New York. Been doing this since I was 18, I'm 66. It's full-time job. Uh, when I was on the road, it was 45 weekends a year. My nickname was the Travel Channel. Certified tarot master, past life retrieval specialist. Yes, spirit guides and angels and mediumship, but I am not dial it dead. Three books, one self-help and two on navigating the wonderful world of WikiWoo. Nice. Gladys stole that, by the way. She absolutely is all over the dial a dead thing now. <laughs> Whenever those, she introduces, yes. she's like, I'm not dial a dead. Gladys Corbeil uh, works uh, with Katrina at Crossroads in Shingle Springs, and she is one kick butt medium. Absolutely love Gladys. Yeah, so she's awesome. thank you again for joining us. Our topic today is there is no I in guru, but there is a me in mentor. We're here to share anecdotes, experiences with both the guru and the mentor, defining them and what their role can be in your life and how you can use that to maximize yourself. So while we're gathering our thoughts about these things and sharing with one another, we definitely want to hear from you. We, again, we're building that wisdom together and we want to share in the communication. So make sure you guys are dropping comments. Make sure you are subscribing and liking so that you know when we're on, go ahead and hit that little notification bell. Um, but in any case, let's go ahead and get started. So Corby, tell us about gurus and mentors and what your experience has been? Well, um, one of the things that I teach in lectures is mentor, yes, guru, no, because for me, it's a very different thing. Now, guru is an honorable title, but it's rare. People like Paramahansa Yogananda, that's a guru. But most of us should be mentors. What's a mentor? A mentor will push you a little farther than you think you can go probably kick you out of the nest a little before you think you should go. And then in the audience, they will clap for you if you get an award at being better at what they do than they are. My perfect example is Meryl Streep clutching her Oscar and thanking her drama professor at Yale. And he's in the audience and he's just rooting her on. Gurus are the ones to me that say, I'm the only one who can know this. I'm the only one who can channel this. I am the only one that can give you this information. Okay, for me, that's people like Esther Hicks and Abraham. The information is good, but don't tell me she's the only one that Abraham is going to talk to. And therefore she has to get all of your money and then you pay to go on a cruise to hear her say the same thing. No, that's my definition. Katrina, what have you got? You know, one of the things that uh, really stuck with me about the Hispanic culture is uh, the titles of Don and Donya. And these are titles of respect that are given to you. You don't decide you're going to be called Don so-and-so or Donya so-and-so. It's, it's bestowed upon you. And I feel the same way about guru. I None of the true gurus ever give themselves the title of guru. That's given to them by students, it's given to them by people that they've helped. And that's really your calling card. If you get somebody who tells you, I am a guru, that right there is your sign 
that this is not where you need to be, that this person is in this for the ego. If you have someone who says, I want to introduce you to my guru, they're amazing. That is a different situation. And one of the most wonderful things I ever had the pleasure of watching was in a store that doesn't exist anymore. It's called, it was called Positive Thought in Lancaster, California. And there was a, an elderly woman that I would later become friends with who was at the counter. And she was like this little bird. And in fact, she was a bird lady. She loved her birds, but she was tiny and uh, gray. Everything about her was gray and her hair went in all different directions. And she had the brightest smile. She was just adorable. And she was there picking up some tarot cards and she happened to be speaking to a person who was in line with her. And the, the woman who was talking to her was one of these kind of lizard women, you, the new age lizard people. And it, Eileen happened to say something very enchanting. And the woman goes, oh, darling, I, who is your guru? You're amazing. And Eileen looked at her and just beamed and said, well, sweetheart, right now you are my guru. Wow. And her, her impression was that everyone we meet is our guru in some way. And so really just be careful. And we're going to talk, I'm sure, in a little bit about some of the uh, things to watch for when people are calling themselves gurus or even calling themselves mentors, because that is a place of authority. And anytime you have a place of authority, you are at risk of someone abusing that authority. But there are amazing mentors out there. There are amazing gurus out there. Gurus didn't just stop with Yogananda. Um, if I were to think about people that I would call a guru, it would be somebody like Deepak, Deepak Chopra. Chopra. I can't say the words now. I'm so tired. Sh you know what I mean? That guy. Chopra. Chopra. That guy. Um, I have people that I would consider almost guru worthy just because of the way that something they said or their influence in some way changed my life. So I think guru is what you do. It's not who you are. It's very interesting. And Eileen, wow. I mean, that, that you are my guru, that hit me. I had to kind of take a deep yeah. breath on that. Right? I mean, it was beautiful. And the big smile that came with it from this tiny, fragile little woman. She had had a, uh, a significant stroke months before I met her. And so she had zero short-term memory, none whatsoever. She lived alone out in Lancaster. I got to be very good friends with her, but she would tell me the best thing about having a stroke is that I know so many amazing people. And because I can't remember them, I get to meet them over and over and over again. And she, she was phenomenal. I, Eileen Kimmel was her name. Nice. She sounds amazing. She was I amazing. As far as my experiences, you know, I didn't actually understand the concept of guru until I had one, have one. Um, I had a chance to meet a guru from, through um, a friend. She brought him to the United States and he came to teach us and, and taking his courses through his courses, I then took him on as a guru. And uh so from what I've learned in my experiences, and I'm sure we'll go into details about the differences and things like that, um, I had many mentors. And what I found is that for these mentors, I went to them sometimes knowing what I needed, sometimes not. Um, you know, they have this particular skill set and it was something that I felt drawn to, called to. And I, so I sat at their feet and, and it seemed that with a mentor, I could ask and they would decide you know, is, is this a, a, a good exchange, a, a teaching relationship? And then with the guru, it was, it was, well, it doesn't matter how often I ask or sit at your feet, like, <laughs> you know, I, you, you are the deciding factor. Um, and there is an exchange. So it seems that the, the guru offers you an opportunity um, to embody a certain and en interact with the embodiment of a certain energy where the mentor is the, uh, the professional at their trade, um, at their you know, practice and what have you. It seems that both can start in the same way, they can develop in the same way, but as, as a person coming to them for service teaching, whatever the case is, it's, it's a different 
um, pathway. One is empowerment, one is being led, it seems. Um, but I'm sure you two have more to say on that. Any thoughts, Corby? Yeah, um, you guys have very different experiences with guru types than I do. But, you know, I'm an irascible New Yorker, what can I tell you? Um, what I have often found is that the ego and the cult of the personality gets in the way. Um, I have an expression, salute the hat, not the hat rack. Um, it came from when I was with uh, a reenactment group called the Society for Creative Anachronism, the SCA, years ago. And every six months, you'd have a crown tournament and people would hit each other with sticks and armor. And the one who was standing at the end became king. And then six months later, somebody did it again. Um, and sometimes you would get really wonderful people who had done deep dish study into the six wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R and what it takes to do wonderful Renaissance theater. So you could understand, yes, I'll curtsy, yes, I'll bow, your grace, your majesty, whatever. Then you'd occasionally get what we called a stick jock. He was just the biggest oaf on the field that day. And he was up there basically slouched and swilling beer and yo, get me this. And we still gave him the same courtesies because it was the throne and the kingship we were saluting, but not him. Um, the example I'll give is there is uh, a place that I have uh, gone to, I went to for 30 years, still use their information because the information is very good. But the um, head of the place was truly a cult of personality. And you either adored the, the ground he walked on or not. And if he wanted to rip you apart in front of the class, you were supposed to say, thank you, sir, may I have another? I didn't do this. And so the interesting thing was I was the only psychic who ever went to this place more than once because they believe there is no such thing as psychic. It's all fast logic. Well, fine. And I'd bring my cards. But this place that taught radical authenticity, I was pulled aside and said, we don't want you, your cards here. You're not to tell anyone you do that. If people ask you to say, no, I'm sorry, I can't discuss it. In other words, we teach radical authenticity, but you must be radically inauthentic while you're here. That is a guru type. That they are so into their teachings that they have no room for anyone to be slightly different so that their teachings can morph, they can be taken to another arena. It's black or white, all or nothing. And that's one of the reasons why perhaps I have never met a true guru. From the way you're talking, it could be Wayne Dyer. Uh, Absolutely. Wayne, Wayne was an amazing, amazing person. But it's the people that see that and say, I want what he had. So I'm going to try and develop it now. Those, those are what give gurus a bad name. Am I making sense here? Do you, Katrina? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with what uh, Dahlia said in, the, in the, the descriptions, because you wouldn't consider Wayne Dyer to be a mentor unless it's to the people who were perhaps apprenticing or interning with him mm -hmm. or, or under his direct tutelage. And that's where I see the difference in a mentor. Is it, like you said, that is a hands-on, uh, usually bringing on apprentices or people who are gonna work with them in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, that's what I think of when I think of as a mentor. But for a guru, I think of somebody who has a mass influence on a number of people mm -hmm. to elevate their energy in some way. So I'm not quite as jaded, I mean, in our, um, pagan community, we have a lot of self-appointed um, experts who um, can be abusive, horribly abusive. We have some of the different groups that can be very uh, dismissive mm -hmm. of the different, the other. And so just like humans have different types of personalities and group interactions, it's the same way in our pagan community out here in, Sa in Sacramento. But um, I definitely have met people through conferences and uh, presentations that I would consider to be a guru because they just have that appeal 
and that way of delivering their message that is relatable um, in, in a kind of uh, cross culture and cross cut way throughout society so that different types of people can hear them. And when I think of the ascended masters and what we think in, of them in that respect, that's what I think of is the people who have the type of um, charisma and articulate speech and the ability to put words in their own mouths that accurately reflect the message they're trying to transmit so that the people easily understand it. When I think of Christ, that's what I think of. Mm -hmm. I think of those parables that he was able to use to convey a simple message that these people were not getting. So he would break it off an allegory. Um, I think about you know the different people I've known that some of them were so humble, they would absolutely just turn beet red that I thought of them as a guru. But it's that outreach, it's that ability to convey that kind of, of wide stream message to so many people that I think of as guru. And so I know a lot of people that I would genuinely consider guru, but I go back to that identification that almost none of them, I don't think Wayne Dyer would have considered himself a guru. Right. No, no. But Tom, it's, what's it's the one that's talk about? Multisyllabic starts with a, a P, uh, a talent or something. He had a particular person that he considered a guru that, um, that was a wonderful teacher. So for him, the idea that I could also take on the title, it's like saying, yes, you know, you're, you're going to have ducks in your hair. It just, it would not happen. But here's what I'll ask you. When does the ego of the teacher topple him off the guru ideal pedestal? When do you forfeit your title because of how you act or how you treat your students? I don't think you do if you have enough people who still accept you in that capacity. I think that any conveyance of the idea of guru isn't coming from self, it's coming from people. So if people are not responding to you because you're not being authentic or you're not being kind or you're not being uh, uh, generous with your teaching in terms of your mindset and how you move forward, um, you know, then you're not going to have an audience and a guru has to have an audience. So I think it's dependent on who's relatable to you. Now, one thing we can say is that, for instance, in politics, there are certain political leaders that I would consider to be a guru only because they have the ability to influence large numbers of people in a specific way with a message they're wanting to deliver. Whether that message is accurate or not, they're wanting to create a response in a large number of people. So to those people, that person is a guru. It's not my guru, but a guru is somebody to me who is able to convey that information in a relatable way to a large number of people. So I don't think that ego, you know, a lot of people are gurus that I see in my, by my de definition, that I see practicing horrible egotistical maneuvers. And that's just part and parcel of the human package. So I think there are gonna be gurus or people that would fall into that definition who are egotistical, who are damaging and uh, who do take advantage of the situation. So when does it topple? When you don't have an audience anymore. Now, can what, we... what would you call a false guru then? If all gurus that have an audience are true gurus, then when do you have a false one? When do you have a capital G and a small g? I don't think you do because, I mean, that's subjective. You know, because I take offense at someone's behavior doesn't mean that the hundred of people that are talking to them do. Uh, you know, just it's, I, I don't, uh, I don't really read it that way as, as far as needing to define for somebody else, whether it's appropriate that they have this person as a guru. I think that the, the highlight here being ego, they do topple themselves. You know, I think that's the, 
the defining piece is the longevity of what they're able to accomplish. So a true guru is that's their life. They, they, again, they embody that. So it is long standing. Your false gurus have, they ride a wave and that wave comes mm -hmm. crashing down on them. The energies around them, they succumb to that. Um, in case in point being a particular healer in Brazil who could create miracles, but was sexually assaulting women on the side. You know, he succumbed to the, uh, the pedestal that people put him on and the, the guru-esque behavior that he, you know, he wasn't necessarily teaching people, but he had people following him mm -hmm. and, and maybe learning from mannerisms, speech, what have you, and still conducting himself in, in terrible ways behind the scenes, he's unfortunately still able to do what he started out, started out doing, probably from a positive place to come to, like I said, succumbed, succumbed to the ego. Um, but Rin has a question here, one of our audience members. Um, she wants to know where the line is drawn between guru and cult leader. Um, and I think Katrina kind of touched on that, uh, but if there's any more insights, I thought we could give that out. I don't think it's necessarily drawn. I think that there's an overlapping uh, label that we might use. And again, it comes down to perception because some people consider the Mormon, the Mormon church to be a cult. The Mormon church does not consider itself to be a cult. And so, you know, it's, that's just a, an example of how large numbers of people can have varying opinions. And there's no certification of guruism. It's not as though someone is handed that title on a scroll to hang on their wall. And then there's a sheriff of guruism that's going to come and take it down if your ego gets out of hand. So, and, and unfortunately, the truth is that many gurus are um, abusive. I mean, that does happen. And uh, cult leaders are often abusive. So whether that's correlation or causation is kind of up to the individual to decide. Uh, you know, that's not to say there aren't any gurus. I mean, guru is, the word guru is kind of like the word hero. You know, when do you stop being a hero? You know, just, yeah. I guess when your level of asshole passes your level of genius or, or ability or your, something. Your asshole passes your brain. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, exactly. that visual. <laughs> Um, and I think we're, we're sort of playing with a word that comes from a culture. Um, so this is where you can't take, guru is, it's Hindu. So you can't take mm -hmm. that and apply American concepts That's exactly to, true. to the, the foundation of the word. People, just in the way that um, people, it is now ideal to stand out in some way, shape or form. So they adopt titles that make you stop and think, um, it started with guru and, and so you could be a, a guru of social media or a guru of wellness. And that just means that you have the following and the, the social backing to, to, claim that space but um, it may not have the cultural reference that it was originally intended that's how I've always seen it that's why I'm much stricter in uh, in how I use it than Katrina no actually this is very good for the audience she and I will not always agree but that's okay differences make good sparks um, because I know it is uh, a Hindu title of honor I am really, really careful about it. Only because I see an awful lot of people do a lot of appropriation with, you know, First Nations stuff yeah. and drives me nuts. Um, but uh, I, I apologize then. I thought we were speaking in generalities. I no, didn't don't apologize. We were... It's your opinion. And we come at it from different places. That's, that's all it is. Most of America is going to use guru the way you do. That's all. Um, 
but because it is a title that can get so appropriated when you haven't earned it, it's it's like it, it titles titles are tough. They they really are. What makes me a certified tarot master? How long I've been doing it, and I passed a bunch of tests. So you know, but you just say. I'm a master of tarot. What's that? There is no better business bureau for tarot readers. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm very aware and maybe bend over backwards and not claiming what isn't mine. And I admit I'm ornery. I don't like seeing other people claim titles that really aren't theirs and a bunch of people following them because they don't know any better. So that's why I'm a little pugilistic about this. The idea that, I mean, if there was another word for guru, that's why I said big G, which is the Hindu, and little G, which is how we use it in America. Um, I just, psychic work, craft work, you know, brujaria to me is smarter about this than most of the rest of it, because, you know, brujeria, that's it. You just don't claim that title. You just don't pull it and say, well, I'm going to say I'm this because I read four books. Although a lot uh, of people do. <laughs> they do. But uh, I think that uh, spiritually and psychically, they're going to get their asses handed to them. I do. Um, the only people who use the title brujeria that I've ever known have damn sight earned them. And that's, to me, that's why that title rings true. Other than, you know, I'm, I'm a head witch. Head of what? Um, titles screw things up. Titles, to me, are ego. Titles are saying, see, I'm better at this than so-and-so. And you're right. If someone doesn't even see themselves as a guru and other people give them that title, that I understand. Because it's... It's a different kind of honorific. Does that make any sense? I'm kind of blathering here, trying to get the idea across. I, I think what we're seeing here is an interesting lens between experience versus culture versus, um, uh, you know, one thing that seems to stand out to me is how mentors offer an opportunity for empowerment and what we talked about last week, discernment, where, um, uh, you know, after that, you've, you've spent time with your mentor, you go on to meet a guru, maybe the, the, the glamour isn't there and you let the guru embody what they're supposed to embody for you, as opposed to like a lot of, of what, gets dealt with in in any um instance with a guru is projection so like a mentor isn't going to allow you to project onto them your ideas of what they are and who they are they're like no this is this is what i am where a guru is is a mirror it's it's you know, uh, it, uh, the guru is a clean slate a neutral body and then when you start throwing stuff on there they don't they don't shift they just you know, they're, they're either there to help you heal or learn or whatever their journey is, but they're, it seems to me, and I don't know, you guys can weigh in on this, but it seems to me like the guru just walks forward and, and we kind of, oh, let me, you know, follow behind, or we go, oh, this is interesting. Let me see where they're going. And, and, and those steps that you take are either taking away from you or they're empowering you through example. I don't know how you guys feel about those things. Any thoughts, Katrina? Nope. Okay. Um, what about, what are you, what are you guys' thoughts on mentorship? I mean, that was the other side of the coin, right? Any thoughts on mentors, Corby? Mentors, again, mentors want you to get to be as good or better than they are at what they do. So it's, again, it's skill-based as opposed to 
spiritual teaching maybe. Um, I, you know, I strive to be a mentor to people when I teach in class, but I remind them they can do what I do. I remind them that I'm not special. And I, I don't take on constant students. I, I give them what I have and then encourage them to go find other people, to, to broaden their base. That's, that's how I deal with mentorship. Uh, what about you, Katrina? What are your ideas around uh, what a mentor is? Um, I was blessed with some amazing mentors as I was coming up and then others that I undertook fields of study that they created without knowing them personally that I consider my mentors because um, they were instrumental in my life in some important way. I do have uh, a strong mentor apprentice relationship with a number of people that uh, I've worked with for a long time. I'm about to take on a new set of students that eventually, uh, usually some of them will elevate from just being a student to being an apprentice. And so they're working with me here in the shop and spending time with, uh, with my practice and what I do. And so um, I normally have a large number of apprentices at any given time and work in a mentor capacity with them. Nice. My personal experience with mentors has, has been sort of, uh, uh, it, it has its highs and lows, right? Like people are still human, no matter their title, good, or good, bad, or indifferent, the, the human element comes forward. Um, for me, I've had a number of mentors uh, wanting to find myself meant looking for people to guide me down that path and, and predominantly mentors allowed that space, um, whether they were good or bad. I, it was an opportunity to learn what I, what was true to me and um, what I was not going to touch with a 10 foot pole. So um you know, I, this is where I kind of, I guess when people approach me, because I've been approached, I feel like I'm too young to be anybody's mentor, but um, I get the, I get approached with the question. And, and the only thing that settles over me is, is God, I don't want to lead these people down the wrong path. And I remember coming to mentors that didn't have that as a thought process, they just sort of were like, this is how it is, and etc. So it's almost like they were a little bit of a blend between the guru and then the guru and the mentor. And then it was like, um, then I would find mentors that were like, well, tell me, think about it. And, and the only defining piece I can reflect on in this moment, and this is funny, it just hit me, is it was a time, being with my mentors was a time when uh, I experienced the most growth, and then um, being with gurus was like, okay, I, I want to work at this, but I don't want to, like, I don't want this to sound like any one way or the other, but I don't want to think too hard about it, like, I just want you to tell me what to do, and I, I, I remember these different points on my path where that came forward, but then having to resolve that in myself because neither, I was fortunate, neither really forced that upon me. Like, I'm going to tell you what to do. They always made me think, which was incredibly frustrating, but um, was absolutely empowering for me. So, um, but mentors, uh, I've predominantly had mentors in my life um, and had a few people I think call me a mentor, but as you can see, I have a, a distant relationship with that title. So it's been an interesting experience. Katrina, what are the things that you consider gold standard for mentors? If, if I, you run into this, yes, this is someone you would want to learn from. I have, it's, it's really pretty simple. And, the, and I employ the same thing with spiritual leaders of any kind. And that is that they need to be experiencing something in their life that I want to emulate. Mm. 
Um, I see this a lot. Again, I, I always reference the pagan community, but I see quite a bit of people putting themselves out there as leaders when their lives are absolute wrecks. Mm. They're struggling with addiction. They're um, impoverished to a uh, monumental degree. To the, uh, And it's not as though they're impoverished and thriving within that poverty. I'm not saying that affluence gives you some kind of spiritual awareness or anything. It's not that. It's a matter of they're uh, impoverished and they're struggling to the point that it impedes their ability to lead in any way. Uh, I see people that um, are for, uh, saying that they're leaders, but they have really uh, horrible interpersonal relationship skills. So they are constantly burning through people and uh, creating what I would call enemies and drama situations one after another, after another, after another. So um, those are people that even though they might have a portion of information that I would wanna pick out and find out about, I don't consider them to be mentors or uh, teachers that I would seek out because they don't have, they're not better at life than I am. And that's kind of what I go for. You know, when I, when I seek somebody out and I want them to want to learn from them, they need to be better at it than I am. They need to be a place where I want to go. I don't want to have to go backwards in my spiritual evolution to be able to capture something from a mentor or somebody I would set up as a, a higher authority. That's great. Did you have the same, like, what are your thoughts, Corby, on in terms of gold standard? When I think of a mentor, they take joy in what they have to share. And they fiercely want to put wings on their students. It doesn't mean that they always give them a pass. Sometimes like John Hausman in the paper chase, he can be really rough on the really good ones because he knows what the potential is. But to be a good mentor for me, I have to see a spark in the student that I can fan into a flame. That's, that's how it is. You know, how do I mentor? I can mentor people with tarot and psychic. I can mentor people on how to do the cancer dance and come out the other side. I can mentor people about how to have a divorce and not hate the person at the end of it. Those are things I know how to do. And it is my belief that if I can teach people how to do those things well, then some of the joy I feel will be passed on to them. Now, if, if I want someone to be a mentor to me, I have to see them have joy in what they do and joy in the partnership, mentor and student. Um, maybe you can teach not having any kind of feeling for your students just to teach the stuff, but that's a teacher, that's not a mentor. A mentor for me is someone where there is a true investment in the student-teacher relationship. That's how I've always operated. Excellent. Uh, we do have another audience question. Bryn is on fire tonight. Um, she says, how do you find a mentor? Um, and I have some thoughts about that because uh, I've had many, but uh, why don't we swing this over to Katrina as far as your journey and, and the mentors that you've come across and interacted with, how did you find them? Any of my mentors, uh, I didn't go seeking them ever. And there, were, there was longing. I've, I've been a person my whole life that was always in search of the eternal mother. I always wanted someone who was older than I was, who was more experienced than I was, who could guide me and keep me from doing stupid things and teach me new things all the time. So I've always had this aching for mentor, to, to find a mentor long-term who would be there for me. I find that most often mentors are not 
permanent additions to your life. They, they tend to be there when you need them and then they move on. Uh, but in no time in my life did any of my mentors actually show up because I went looking for somebody and said, I want to learn this and I want to be mentored by this. They often found me or serendipitously I met them and was excited about what they were doing and began to learn from them. But uh, I, I would say that if you're looking for a mentor, the best thing to do is to light a candle and put a call out there for one and just see what comes. But I, there's an old saying in paganism that is when the, the student is ready, the teacher will come. And I believe that that's true. I think that's a universal saying. <laughs> Absolutely. Corby, did you, what was your journey with finding mentors or was that the case? I didn't trust any of them. I'm ornery. Remember that. Um, I would see that someone was a mentor after the fact. And um, I have respect for them, gratitude toward them. But um, I was... I was never really good with mentors. I have always been someone who has been the wolf at the edge of the pack. I'm not going to say lone wolf because, you know, I have friends, things like that. But when it came to teaching, teaching me, I didn't really have mentors. I had people I watched and decided that's someone I would like to be like. I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Um, you have to have a level of trust to have a mentor. And, you know, I mean, I will confess, I trust very rarely and it's very difficult. So it's one of the reasons perhaps that I don't take on a lot of students. It's because for me to be in that mentor relationship, I have to do make that trust bridge between myself and the student. That's it's how I work. Um, things have mentored me. Crises have mentored me. Um, the stuff that I learned at the place in Massachusetts, if they were mentors, but it wasn't one person, it was the classwork, it was the ideology, it was the methodology. Um, but I never felt like any of them were mentors that I would point to and say, that's my mentor. So in that sense, I may be just one, one of those, those weird hedge children. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think for me, it's been a little bit of both. I guess like I, <laughs> as I sit between you two, I seem to be a little bit of both. Um, I definitely found myself wanting to, like I mentioned earlier, get to know myself. And then some of my mentors would appear in that space. Like, you know, being in a marriage where I had no idea who I was, putting myself on meetup for business reasons, and then finding my mentor in the process of, of thinking that meditation would be helpful to me. And then going, oh my God, this person may be helpful to me on that path. And then sitting at their feet, gaining knowledge whenever I could. And then also having life experiences where, you know, they just pull you through the ringer and, and, and that, that illness, that heartbreak, that tragedy becomes a bit of a mentor as well. So um, I think there's opportunities for both, uh, but the overarching theme being, it seems between the two of you, like what is going to help me, what or who putting the call out to the universe is going to help me get back to me and, and to help me be the best version of me. Cause obviously we can't be these mentors or these gurus cause you're not meant to be somebody else. You're meant to be yourself and, and, you know, seeking, seeking better than, than you were yesterday is even an opportunity for growth and, and, um, mentors can draw you into that space and and sometimes it's as simple as somebody I, again I cannot go far enough from it was Eleanor right Katrina 
Eileen. Eileen, sorry. Um, that that mirror piece, you know, a lot of my mentors just asked great questions and then got me into better spaces because they were just um they were masters at that. So um and now I I offer the same. I just ask a lot of questions and people go, oh. <laughs> so um yeah. With the uh, mentor and guru uh, titles and concepts, I wonder if some, a question that comes to my mind is how many of your mentors actually like know that you call them mentors? Like what is your, what has your interaction been with that? I know a couple of people I've, I've said you are my mentor and they're kind of like, ah, okay. And then there are other people that are like, yeah, we, we sat, we, we did extended time together. Katrina. You know, when I was learning Berea, the, the thing is that is a very um, structured apprenticeship situation. And so it's very authoritarian in that case, you know, that you're a student, there is no doubt. Mm. And they don't call themselves mentors, but they absolutely demand. I had two brujos and a bruja and they demand that authority. They demand that respect. Um, you're not, nothing is sugar-coated. You're not, um, it's not easy. Um, it's not gentle by any means. And so there's no question in, in my mind that, that they consider themselves my mentors, even though that's not the word that they would use. Mm -hmm. Their idea is I'm senior to this person. I taught this person. I gave her the title. I'm, um, you know, my work here is done kind of thing. <laughs> um, so they, the, the ones that were instrumental in that part of my life were very structured in our relationship we were not hanging out on the corner drinking 40s after they taught me okay it's not a a social situation there's a strong um at least with me and it could have also been the cultural separation but they were there to teach me a specific thing in all three instances they came to me instead i'm going to teach you this because this is what you're supposed to do so that was a specific circumstance where there was no question that they were my mentors. They just, I mean, they walked into my shop and, and it was game on and they didn't know each other. It was three different people, but the um, relationship was the same. So the other people that I know, uh, Maya Shally Gray is my conjure mentor. Uh, Thomas Prower, also more of a cultural mentor because he knows more about different cultures in the world than any human I've ever met. He wrote Queer Magic. He wrote Morbid Magic. Um, the first Santa Marte book or experience I ever had was with him. So he was instrumental in absolutely changing my life. I just worship at this guy's feet and it absolutely makes him enormously uncomfortable and he and I are personal friends I, I enjoy him very much but he would be just absolutely <laughs> if I were to even mention him being a mentor he's he's just an amazing presenter um, and then you know other people that I've known probably probably no you know they wouldn't consider themselves to be mentors um, I don't call myself a mentor with my students, I'm their teacher. When I ran a, a circle, like an actual coven, part of the initiation was, I'm gonna be your magical mommy now. And that was part of the agreement between us was a spiritual parentage that happened. But I didn't use the word mentor then either. So uh, I've got people that call me their mentor and I'm like, eh, whatever, you know, teacher, mentor, whatever you wanna say, whatever terminology, allows you the familiarity that we need, then that's what we're going to do. All right. hearing, hearing that, I would say I probably had maybe two. My first one was when I was late teens, early 20s, and that was Sephora Katz, who was High Priestess of Blue Star Coven at that point, who took this absolute yutz 
and knocked me upside the head to give me enough sense to walk in the world, not walk between the worlds, walk in the world. And um, it's why um, 40 years later, I mean, we lost touch with each other for 38 and we've just been back for two years. I'll still affectionately call her boss and she'll still call me brat, but there's love behind it. Uh, the other mentor I had has been a, a long time mentor um, in interesting ways. And that's Wendy Peeney from ElfQuest. Uh, I worked for them for many, many years. Uh, I'm friends with them, but Wendy is usually a step to the side and in front of most of us. And so she has pulled me um, willingly, but pulled me through some dark inner places and helped me look at what I didn't want to. So for me, that's another mentor. But um, other than that, hey, you take a look at my pre-birth plan. I have a terrible time with authority. So it's no surprise I only have two when I'm 66. So. For me, I would say probably the vast, I use, I use it. I use the word mentor um, with the people that are teaching me because I, uh, for me, it's I want them to know how much I respect them and um, the, the, the way they impart in my life is from that teaching space. And so um, predominantly, uh, much like uh, Katrina was mentioning, they just kind of go, eh, you know, and they, they accept me as the, you know, annoying question asker you know, I don't want to do this wrong, but you know, you're going to empower me to do at least something. And if I need to make a mistake, then, then go for it. So, um, my, yeah, my, I was going to say my, my meditation, my first, uh, instance with meditation, I definitely would call her a mentor. Um, she did not call herself. So I, I guess to my question, I don't have anybody that called themselves a mentor, but they mentored me. Um, and so I, we, but we had that interest, they're very interesting, like by the book relationship, but I think it was something that I put on them. So if they said like one of my first mentor was like, you know, you fast before you do readings and, or um, shamanic journeys and things like that. And I was kind of like, oh, okay. And then years later had to figure out, oh, I'm anemic, that's not a good idea. <laughs> and so, you know, but I was so adamant that I respect what I was taught that I was willing to die for it <laughs> or at least pass out, maybe not die. Um, so so that was the uh, my experience with whether or not mentors had been um, actually called mentors for me. So we are at this very interesting time. It is six minutes until the witching hour. <laughs> not really, that's midnight, I think, right? Yes. I try not to be offensive. Um, but so let's, let's talk, guys. Let's, what is our... If you could offer our audience any closing thoughts or messages, um, what would you say? We'll swing it over to Katrina. Closing thoughts? You know, I have never, never in my life referred to someone as my guru or had what I consider to be a guru. It's not even a word I used until I looked at the list of suggestions of topics that Corby pulled up and I had to stop and think about what that word meant to me and how I might have applied it. Uh, obviously, she's given it a great deal more consideration than I ever did and uh, seems to have a lot more animosity toward the word than I do. Um, I did, uh, the, you know, for me, I think the person that I would say as a, a guru that had the greatest influence on me, honestly, was Dr. Phil. Uh, there was a book called Life Strategies that absolutely changed my life. And this was before he kind of went off the rails. And uh, so, you know, that's the only thing I would even come close to with that mentors. I've had a lot of amazing ones. And so what I would say from this side of, the, of life, 
a little bit further into it is don't sweat the mentor thing. Don't um, aggressively covet it or chase it. If you have a, a place of expertise that you would like to explore, be there, be present for it, be plugged into it. Uh, pay attention to the online groups and options that are there. When the world open, opens up again, there are still bookstores out there. There are still metaphysical stores if, if your interest is metaphysical. Meet people. Go to uh, psychic fairs and pagan pride experiences and things like that to see who is doing what you want to learn. And you will intuitively feel who you're drawn to and whose message resonates with you. But I really don't think, I, I really think it's like looking for fairies. I think that as soon as you try to see it, you're not gonna be able to see it, the mentor. You have to just really be open and again, light your little candle, put your light out there and say, I want to learn this. Bring me somebody who can help me learn. And that might look like a book. And maybe you read somebody's book and you get something out of it. You happen to drop that author an email and say, this really moved me what you said here. And you start a relationship with them. It does happen. So we're in an unprecedented place of communication in our world right now. It's not as though you have to wait for them to drive up to your front door. So just stay solid on what you're doing and plug in and engage and show up and be present for what you want to learn and the mentor will present. Absolutely. Corby? I agree with uh, what Katrina says. The only thing I would add is check your gut, check their authenticity level. If they feel authentic to you, move forward. If you at all suspect, not your person, step aside, your person will come. So my closing thoughts here would be, you know, to our original point, there is no I in guru, but there is a me in mentor. And um, I think both of you have cultivated a lot of thoughts or, and beautiful insights around that path of self, leading back to self um, in both scenarios, whether we're searching for ourselves or searching for uh, practice in a particular field or um, study, the guru or rather the mentor or whoever with or without the titles, they show up, the appropriate person shows up either to show you uh, an opportunity to be one way or to not be the other. And so um, with that, uh, we have had an awesome discussion. I wanna leave you guys with what these beautiful ladies are up to. So as always, you can find Katrina at, um, crossroadsoccult.com. She's got a lot of great services, a lot of great healings. Again, cannot, I, I don't know if I will ever stop talking about the Olympia I had. And um, Katrina, I'll be seeing you in March for another one because these are now self-care. <laughs> so um, you can find her at crossroadsoccult.com. You can also find her on her YouTube page. A lot of amazing information, a lot of great offerings there, teaching opportunities, adopt her as your mentor. Um, and um, you can find her on Facebook as well on the Crossroads Occult Facebook page. Now, Katrina is also an author, so you can find her on Amazon and I will put those links in the con comments. Uh, and. If you want to spend more time with her, she does readings on her page weekly on Thursdays. And um, this is our Witches at the Crossroads hour. It's at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Thursday. Um, Nelta and Gladys are amazing. So if you want a good time, good laughs, and great information, insight, uh, you can find them there every Thursday. I highly recommend you guys check it out. And as for Corby, you can find her on YouTube as well, doing meditations. And um, they're really great opportunity to um, just settle from all the nonsense and 
Um, they're usually themed in different ways, so you can find what works for you. If you're looking for more of a uh, personalized opportunity, she also has a Patreon page, and you can find her at CorbyMitlight.com and as on Facebook under the Fire Through Spirit page. So um, there is no shortage of how you can link up with these ladies. Corby is an author as well. You can find her on Amazon, and we will put those links in the comments. For her upcoming event, she has an event on this coming, nope, I'm sorry, in March, on March 14th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, because we are on the East Coast over here, on Facebook Live on the Fire Through Spirit page, she will be doing her free reading hour, and then on March 20th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, for three hours, three whole hours, you will get to do your sentence of passion. This can be your your guiding star, the, the sentence that really helps you bring that energy to life, helps you show up in ways that you desire. So you're not going to be told what your sentence of passion is. You're going to be creating it. Um, and that opportunity is going to be in partnership with East West Bookshop. And so uh, again, that link will be in the comments. During her um, connection with East West Bookshop on the 20th and as well as uh, on the 21st, she will be doing one-to-one -one readings as well from 2.30 to 5.30 on the 20th and 9 a.m. to 5.45 um, on the 21st. Now, I want to just add that this uh, Sentence of Passion event and the one-to-one -one readings will be based on Pacific Standard Time because she'll be working with um, the, the West Coast at that point in. And so with all of those things, you will be able to find and connect with these wonderful human beings. And, um, you know, again, we love your participation. Thank you for your wonderful comments and feedback. Keep them coming. We want to keep this interesting. And, and this, is, this is your show, guys. This is for you. So, um, let us know what you need, and we're here. We're here to support that. Um, in any case, it is. Are we ever going to end at nine on the nose? Who knows? <laughs> but um, in any case, I want to bid you all uh, a good night or a, a good afternoon, if that's where you are. Good evening, and um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.